actually the, the first fatalities in over two years on an American <coughs> commercial flight. Oh, yeah, two and a half years since. Uh, okay. Well, hello wherever you are. We're in the Key Bank Gallery of the Battle of Plattsburgh Association Museum. Former stables, if you will, on Plattsburgh Air Force Base with Dr. Richard Frost. How are you, Richard? Not An bad, official Gordy. handshake. How about yourself? I'm just doing fine. <laughs> You've been walking. Yeah, I tell people all day long that walking's good for them. I think everybody should take at least a half hour walk every day. And, and here we are, you and me. Exactly. <laughs> the elder statesman of the... <laughs> oh, I don't know about elder. I keep redefining that term. <laughs> uh, well, we try. Calvin's Calvin's tracking 10 years behind, so we got to get him walking 50 minutes a day. We're uh, doing this just one day before Valentine's Day on February 13th, 2009. Way more sunshine than I guessed we would have this afternoon. The winds have died down. We had some nice weather for about two minutes, didn't we, earlier in the week, and it seems like... Wow, here I, we are. I found out on the way in that we do have a fair amount of ice, however. <laughs> the, I managed to slip on, right on the way to the studio. Oh, no, you all right? I'm fine. Oh. I'm fine. I'm ready to keep walking. Oh, my goodness. You know, the, the, uh, you can see it in your driveway. And those of us who live in Plattsburgh on this day, everybody will be watching this maybe a month from now saying, what are they talking about? But it snowed quite a bit in the higher elevations last night. That I didn't realize. Yeah, uh, we saw... I, all I remember is the rain that we had here earlier in the My week. wife and I were heading home from our 40-minute walk this morning, and we saw cars coming from the higher peaks, and they were covered with snow. And my son Dale works for DOT, and I said, How, did you work overtime? Oh, yeah, they got a lot of snow up in the mountains. We had to have so many trucks out last night. and Well, it's the winter time. Exactly. It doesn't matter what the groundhog says. You know we're not going to escape this <laughs> early in the season. <laughs> And uh, who knows from Punxsutawney Phil, every, every town wants to have one of those groundhogs or, or ground chipmunks or whatever they are these days. But we know we're going to have, you know, as I said to Calvin the other day, we'll, we'll consider ourselves lucky if we only have six more weeks of winter. No, I, I, I would tolerate winter just fine if it ended on March 21st like they made me memorize in school all those many years ago. I know. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> yeah, that would be just absolutely great. Well, we are here, and we are feeling good today, you and me, and I trust you are feeling uh -huh. good, uh -huh. uh, because we do exercise. Taking a, taking a walk seems like a small thing, but you know what? If we could get everybody in this country to take that walk that you talk about all the time, there would be less need for physicians like you I'm ready to I'm I'm ready to accept that. That's uh, <laughs> people taking care of themselves is probably the most important thing. And you know, everybody tells me there's no time, and I realize the 24-hour day doesn't always leave a lot of extra time. But as I've told a few patients, even in the past week, what I'm telling people now is the President of the United States is finding time to exercise every day. Therefore, you can find some time to exercise every day. He plays a little one-on-one -on -one <laughs> and horse every now and again. And during his campaign, they had all they could do to keep up with him, shooting <laughs> so, baskets wherever he stopped. Yeah. But there's a lot to be said for one foot forward. This is the latest book. Correct. Taking a walk through northern New York. And, you know, a friend of ours is writing an anthology with people like me doing little chapters saying what nature and what the out of doors has meant to them in their lifetime. And it's so interesting and so fortuitous, as W.C. Fields used to say, that you and I should be getting together today to talk about walking. But I just wrote 3,000 words for his, for his book about walking in the woods, all the wonderful things that have happened just by Finding this North Country delicious to be out in in all seasons. No argument there. This is uh, Why One Foot Forward. How long did it take you to come up with a title? I want to know that. The title actually went through many, many changes. Oh, about, did it really? About <laughs> once a week. That's. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't <laughs> stand that. Once I, a week? And I had, to set, I had to settle for a subtitle that told what the material was. But if I just called a book, Walks in Upstate New York, it doesn't catch anybody's eye, so I used one foot forward, and we'll see how many eyes it catches. Yeah, and if it's the best foot forward, then that's okay, too. 
give either either photo count. Let's, for those of you who haven't seen the previous interviews you and I have done, and the private and don't know about the private conversations we've had about other books and photographs about Plattsburgh, you've been around here for a while. You were born actually in where Glens Falls. Glens Falls. No, I was actually born in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. And my family moved to Glens Falls when I was six months old, so I don't get to say I'm a native, but all my formative years were there. And you went to high school? Glens Falls High, graduated uh, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the dark and distant yeah. past, doesn't it? It does seem, you know, it's interesting. When I go back there, it seems like it wasn't that long ago. Uh, but when you look at the piece of paper they gave you at graduation, it turns out it was four decades. Isn't that amazing? So. Well, mine is much, much longer <laughs> than that. And it's pleasant for me to go back to my little tiny town of Moira, the old Moira High School where I graduated in 1955, and to renew those friendships. It's, it's always interesting to go back to. I do go to my high school reunion, oh, every five or ten years, and the conversations seem to pick up from just where you left off the last time. Isn't that amazing? And I think it's just we, those are the years you're going through so many experiences together, and I think it's enough of a bond that it's, it's, it's very easy to get together with people again and, and quickly start reliving and then moving forward from there. It's fun. Uh, I'm not sure any of us changed the world as much as we thought we were going to. Uh, <laughs> you mean all that stuff <laughs> in the yearbook never came true? Well, those are the things we have to uh, accept, I guess, in life. You know what? You have made your mark in so many different ways, so this is not a time to be modest. And if you are, yeah. I'll take care of that before <laughs> we're through here. Uh, you, where did you go to college? Went to college in Connecticut at a small liberal arts school, Wesleyan University. Oh yes, and a great school. Good. It was pretty demanding school. I can tell you that. Yeah. But it was. It was a good school. It was a good place to be. And then what? Uh, went on. I. That's when I got tired of winter. And uh, <laughs> all right. And I headed south. Uh, and uh, went to medical school at Duke University in North Carolina. Yeah, and there is a wonderful school. So many great things have happened at Duke. Well, and of course a lot of them revolve around basketball, and I'm probably, <laughs> the misfortune I had is I think that I was there for the only four consecutive years that the team had losing seasons. Come on. And I never, every, the season, the success of the season depended solely on whether or not they beat their arch rival, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill that year. Oh, and I, no matter how bad they were, they managed to win one of the two games every year against Carolina. That's great. And the Tar Heels beat them a couple of nights ago, uh, just, yeah. just so you know. I keep I, track of those things. I was happy to see they left that out of the local <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I kind of watched uh, both of those teams for a long time, and I like college basketball far better than the NBA, if you don't mind. And, uh, you know, to watch Duke... And uh, the Tar Heels go at it is always fun. It's one of the best sports rivalries in America. It, it's just great. So you went to medical school there. Right. And then? Went on to do my internship and residency in internal medicine at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. I did not know that until just now. Ah, no and, kidding. And so those, so it, that, um, I enjoyed the South. I would have stayed in the South except for the fact that I missed the Adirondack fall, and that's what brought me back up north. But I was in Lexington when it was a pretty rapidly growing city. Uh, it was a terrific place to train. Uh, the, the work, um, the hours we spent during internship and residency, I don't like to think much about anymore. I mean, it was well, internships and residencies in those days were grueling, but we certainly learned a lot. They're still grueling, and that whole process is still open to a great deal of conversation slash controversy even as we're sitting here there are people debating that there will always be people debating that <laughs> but here you are well it's uh it, it it's kind of the good thing about being in training is eventually the training ends and you get to go out into the real world yeah and the real world for you started around lexington right well i was there for uh, i was there for for three years uh, i went into the public health service after that so i was in western new york for two years and then we came here. Lexington, as, as we're recording this in February of 2009, they've had some horrendous weather in Kentucky, and there are still maybe more than 100,000 people without power there and in, in Ohio. As, as we were just down there last week, my, our son, my son is a psychologist, and he has a, 
he has a clinic right there in Burlington, uh, Kentucky, right near the, right across the bridge from Cincinnati. Okay. Uh -huh. And I have connections with that state because my father left Rochester as a young man early in the 20th century, decided to seek his fortune with $3.25 in his pocket, began to hitchhike toward Kentucky. And we drove across the bridge he walked across. <laughs> that great old bridge that uh -huh. was started in the 1870s. And what a thrill that was. And to think, this guy <laughs> ended up at a little tiny college called Kingswood in Kentucky. And now, you know, my son ha has a business there in northern Kentucky. So, but we feel badly for these people with weather because they don't know how to, I don't mind they, saying they don't know how to plow snow down there. Well, my. We were coming down I-75 <laughs> last week and I said, this is the day we're going to die. My wife's sisters have been among those 100,000 plus without power. Have they really? Over these last few weeks. And, of course, we have lots of advice for them having lived through the ice storm here, but they don't have a wood stove to cook on. <laughs> And, and some of the other things that made it a little easier for us. We're far more prepared than they are in many ways down there. No question. So in no any question. case, then you went to Buffalo? Uh, it was actually in between, uh, I, I was in Orleans County, which is halfway in between Rochester and Niagara I Falls. I know it very well. Uh, up near the shore of Lake Champlain. Not Lake Champlain. That lake, that's, you're right, but there, Lake Ontario. There is another lake. <laughs> we, we like to think this is <laughs> a, as the greatest of the Great Lakes, but we went through that before. That'll be my only typographical <laughs> error of the day. <laughs> I love it. So you're there for, for a couple years? Two years. Two years, and then? And then came here. Yeah. And that was what year? Uh, 1979. It'll be wow. 30 years this summer. Uh, in fact, that well, actually, puts it I, into perspective, doesn't it? Huh? I, I started practicing in the fall. Actually, uh, I probably shouldn't say this on television. I was supposed to start practicing in the summer, but I told you I was born in Baltimore, and I've been a Baltimore Oriole fan for mu most of my life. We can't hold that. And against you. back then, that year they were in a pennant race, so I just kept coming up with ways to postpone <laughs> things for a couple of weeks till I saw how things were going to go. And when I clinched uh. the pennant. I told him I'd be ready to start work exactly the third week of October, right after it? the World Series. Don't you love it? <laughs> when you're a sports fan, we can't help what we do sometimes, you know? Where it makes you kind of pathetic at it's, one time uh... or another. So you eventually made it back up here. Yep. And have you been in the same home since then? Yes. Uh-huh. That's a beautiful yeah. home, and we love it uh... down there. And you, you uh, were here for, what, about nine years before you started writing your column? That's a good question. Let me think. I started 79 writing. to 88. Yep, that's right, because I started writing a column in uh, the spring of 88. I do pay er, attention winter. to you, you know. Doc. I'm glad that you've been reading it from day one. <laughs> well, I have, and, it, and there isn't anybody that doesn't know your real name and your pseudonym, <laughs> right? Well, well, how did you come up with a pseudonym, and why did you do that? I have to say that I don't know how I came up with that pseudonym exactly, but... Uh, I thought if I had a pseudonym that it would mean I wouldn't, I was busy, obviously, in, in, in my practice. Sure. And I didn't want the extra phone calls and I didn't want extra attention. I wanted to do the writing. And I thought that I would be able to somehow keep the pseudonym under wraps. But it remained I, anonymous and that I, lasted I, about 35 minutes, right? I should have learned from Mark <laughs> Twain that you can never do oh, that. Oh, no. Although I will tell you that. I did pretty well until about five or six years into my now 20 plus year writing career for the Press Republican when they said that their new policy was to put a picture of the columnist in with the That'll column. That'll do it. And we reached a compromise. See this face <laughs> that a mother and everybody else could love. Well, so that was the end of it for you, wasn't it? We reached a compromise. They had a staff <laughs> artist draw a caricature and so the caricature was used. And then one Sunday morning, I woke up and looked in the paper, and there was a picture. Yeah. Uh, not that I know where they got the picture from, but it, it actually was me. And uh, after that, the pseudonym kind of went by the wayside. And that's okay, too. And, it's just uh, another fun chapter so. in your life. How many... Mention the pseudonym. The, oh. the pseudonym was Richard Landon. And uh, it's a, I don't that's a have, classy name, you I know. I don't have a good story for how I came up with the name. Um uh, 
I was smart enough to keep the first name the same, so if somebody called my name on the street, I'd still turn around. <laughs> but, uh, That's very, so you just, you mean you, you pulled it out of a hat? So to speak. Yeah. So to speak. Uh-huh. And just, it's a real classy name. I thought that was really cool. Maybe, maybe someday you can use that, you know? I mean, St Stephen King uh, uses other names. A lot of writers just use another name just f to try it out. I'm sure that one of these days, if I have the same success as Stephen King does, I'll want to try out a pseudonym again. You let me know when that happens, <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be following you so closely, our bodies will touch each other. But it's, it's... You know, we've said it before and we'll say it again. This North Country is a wonderful place to live and work. You've been practicing internal medicine here for all those years and, and writing and walking. And how many pieces have you written for the paper? Are you keeping track? I'm actually not keeping track. It's, it's, it's clearly, well, you figure 25 to 35 a year for 20 years puts me in the six to 700 range, and I've written a few pieces for other other newspapers and, and yeah. magazines as well. I don't think I've hit a thousand. I guess someday I should go back and do a count. So if I do write uh -huh. a thousand, I can make a uh, uh, make a big play out out of it. You know, we Kelvin and I laugh at it all the time. He keeps track because he's been doing this television bid since the early 80s. And when Bob Venn died and I left radio in 97, we started this. So he has a pretty good idea on how many shows we've done. It's a little bit scary when you think that each one of these shows is as long as 90 minutes. But I started writing for the Press Republican about that same time. So 12 years, 12 times 52. Yeah, okay, you're <laughs> right you up know. there. Well, I'll be, I'll be looking for your thousands, Colin. Well, but, but, you know, your pieces are far more ambitious than mine. Mine are, I call mine fluff. You, but you've been, you, you've had very little fluff. You've got, you've got hammer and nails. Well, I don't think any writing is fluff because, as you well know, an effort goes into writing anything that's going to be uh, publicly printed and always needs some reworking. The... The only thing I really do different from yours is I make myself go someplace for each column that I write. That's just absolutely wonderful. And so, as a result, your life has been enriched before you ever wrote the columns. No question about it. In, my, in, in, in the first book I wrote, which was a compilation of columns, I, I made the comment that when we moved here, it was right after one of the first oil and gas crises in the world, and I kind of made the statement that I want to live somewhere that if I can't drive more than 100 miles away the rest of my life, there'll still be plenty to do. And this area certainly qualifies. I don't know how many people have seen that book, but I want to just hold it up here. I'm looking at you on the back, and you don't look not one iota different. Well, that's good, because I use the same cover, the same picture in the new book. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, Calvin? Yeah, I read the, read the Richard Landon book. Right, yeah. right. And the author and his dog, Fury? Furry, Furry. Oh, that's even better. I'm sorry. <laughs> there is a difference between Absolutely. Furry and Fury. No, that's it's... got two R's on it. Okay. Now, which one is Furry? Oh, here we go. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was a left-handed compliment or a... The, uh, I love it. It'll anyway. be Furry that'll be upset about that comment. <laughs> but I remember when this book came out, and it was... Very nicely accepted, and you donated all the profits of this book, didn't you? Right. The, the entire proceeds of that book went to the CVPH Foundation uh, for their public education programs and, and other support What programs. a magnanimous thing to do. And I was serving on the foundation at that time and for uh, many years, and we, we saluted you uh, when you weren't present many times. So, and uh, this, is, this is, isn't it fun for you even, you know, back in... Look at this and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. Manchester, oh, yeah, I was there. No, no, I absolutely, and, and most of those places I've been back, so one of these days I'll have to rewrite another compilation and kind of update some of those. I was going to say, kind of it's, it's time those. for a, maybe a, another day away or a weekend we'll, away. We'll, or we'll, a, call, we'll call it a day away, too, or something, you know, pretty uh, unique like that. Yeah. Now, you didn't, uh, you didn't publish this with Larry. No, you, uh -uh. you picked another no. another publisher. No, I actually the person who assisted me with that uh, and is responsible for all the design and, and the fact that it came out well was uh, Suzanne Pearlie, who no longer oh, lives in the area. Yeah, 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 but yeah. she, 
she did a good job of putting that together and she all I enjoy doing the research I enjoy doing the writing um, I need somebody else who's going to be able to make sure the whole package goes together in terms of editing and design and making sure I meet deadlines and she was good <laughs> at it as, as Larry was with the new book that's great and then you and I did spend some time talking with each other around my living dining room table mm -hmm. when you were doing Plattsburgh, New York, a city's first century that we've talked about before. And this, this is what I would call a most ambitious project for you. That was one of those six-month projects that I was able to complete in just under three years. And, uh, <laughs> Have I been down that road and, before? Yes. And I, uh, I certainly learned a lot along the way. Uh, it, this is where I learned that it's easier to write a long book than a short book. Because after I had done two years of research and was ready to write it, um, I had to leave a lot out. To uh, This was done uh, under contract for the city of Plattsburgh it's, as part of its centennial celebration as a city in 2002. And it was supposed to be a 200-page book. And that's when you find out that it's sometimes easier to write a 250- or 300-page book than a 200-page book. But um, I think I gave people a pretty good overview of What's happened? what had happened here in the first hundred years as a city. Some of the problems hadn't changed. In 1902, they were trying to figure out what to do about balancing the city budget. They were talking about whether or not they should be doing more development along the lakefront. Uh, there were issues about attracting industry. Some of these things never seemed to change. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of traffic congestion in 1902, but they did need more places for horses, and there were stables around town. Ironically, they, the city, of course, was manufacturing cars back then, and that was one of they the They certainly state. were, and we've talked about it so yeah. many times, not to mention the Plattsburgh Traction Company and the right. trolleys. And, right. Uh, and a lot of the interest for you, the fun and, at times, real drudgery, was collecting these photographs and then trying to find out who are these people, right? It, it was the photographs were never drudgery. Uh, never too hard. It's the I I put notices in the newspaper. I asked. I, I tried to get the word out to as many people as I could about the book being written and hoping people would come forward with old photos. I called you for old photos. I ended up with a treasure trove of photos, and then I wanted to start identifying people. And I was able to identify a surprising number. And every now and then, there's one of those special moments. There was one photograph I had of a group of men on the steps of City Plattsburgh City Hall. I remember Hall. very and well. I, and that was one of the last photos I got identified before it went to the publisher. But a retired teacher in town, just all of a sudden, wide-eyed, took her, just pointed with her finger and said, "That's my husband." This is when everybody got together to leave for World War II. Wasn't, and then all of a sudden, epiphany it's, right it's, there. It, it, that's that's a good word, <laughs> and it the it, and that's how history comes alive, and that's why I I think that we do a disservice to students and adults alike by not teaching as much history as we used to, and not getting people as immersed in it. When you have a chance to talk to somebody who's in a photo that to me is history, and to her was an important part of her life, uh, there's a whole different texture and and dimension to it. You know, you've just said some things that uh, uh, just charm, charm me to death because we've spent so much time embracing our North Country history. Look where we're sitting today. True. In this wonderful old building. Look at this historical campus. Did you ever dream 15 years ago that you would have a Battle of Plattsburgh Association Museum, a Transportation Museum, a Clinton County Historical Association Museum. Did you ever guess that we'd have this campus here? Well, in fairness, at that time, nobody would have guessed because it the wasn't. Was it was here. beyond anybody's wildest dream that there wasn't going to be an Air yeah, Force base exactly, here yeah. uh, forever. I think it's wonderful that these buildings got reserved and that these three museums are in close proximity. Uh, I think that that heightens their availability uh, and accessibility, not just to our community, but I think having three museums together on the same campus with different uh, perspectives on our history also will end up being a magnet for tourism as well. And I think that's one of the things that the city uh, should 
emphasize when it's going out to uh, try to entice visitors to come to our region? We hope so, and we're doing this long before, well, we're doing this in the quadricentennial year, aren't we? Correct, correct. So we're talking about history coming right to us and many things planned on both sides of uh, Lake Champlain, up right. and down the Hudson River and, and here in northern New York to, to uh, commemorate and celebrate the fact that Samuel D. decided to make his little journey down here. It turns out that's one thing Plattsburgh's been good about is celebrating some of its history in the past. The, uh, you know, the 300th anniversary of Samuel Champlain discovering the lake that so now has his name shindigs they had was here. Uh, a seven or eight day extravaganza yes. that included you know, the president, the governors of both states, uh, diplomats from England and France, it was it, it was it was more than a shindig. They had uh, they had pageants all along the lake. They uh, built uh, stat they commissioned statues to co commemorate the event. It really was a, a a pretty grand occasion. City of Plattsburgh took it a step further because only a few years later was the bicentennial of the Battle of Plattsburgh, and that was time for another celebration. And the Secretary of State was here. That's one of the things I pointed out in the book. Plattsburgh was pretty well known throughout the country back then, and it was not on, it's, as to us it would be a big event today if the president were to come to visit uh, to Plattsburgh in 1909. It wasn't that, it was, I'm sure it was a special event, but it wasn't an unusual event because the last seven or eight presidents had also come to visit. But that, the, the centennial of the Battle of Plattsburgh was in 1914, right. and now we'll have the bicentennial right. coming up just five years from now. Correct. Something Calvin and I have talked about for a long time, and we don't know who's going to push each other around in a wheelchair when it happens, but we're pretty sure yeah. we can make it. They'll probably have a tandem wheelchair <laughs> already. <now. laughs> but you're right. We do have so much history here. And when I walk in the woods, and when you walk in the woods, I think a lot about the the Native Americans who walked in those woods and had camps along our, our rivers and our lakes long before the first, quote, white settlers came over here and, and traipsed down through. And, you know, if you, can feel, if you can feel the history, I think you've accomplished something. I think if you can feel it, you've accomplished something. And then if you can convey that excitement to somebody else, yeah. then, then, then you've accomplished something that's equally important. I yeah. think we all should be both proud of our history and interested in it, and I think it's part of what our future is going to be, whether it be through heritage tourism or creating a sense of place that went, that makes somebody who grows up here want to stay here and start a business here that's going to help the community prosper. It pleases me when I see young people wanting to become history teachers. Mm -hmm. I have a grandson whom I'm encouraging almost daily in his efforts along that line. And I know a young, young, young man whom we actually interviewed um, before he started teaching in the schools, Billy Duffany, whose dad was a police chief here for a long time. And Billy's a history teacher up in the High Peaks. Um, but he, he personified that great almost lust to take in the history of this area. And his ancestors were involved in aviation here. And he did a presentation on it that we recorded, and he blew me away. He sounded like Mr. College Professor in his 20s, and I was so impressed. So history is very, very important. But isn't it nice just to get out? Absolutely. And take a walk. Absolutely. And that brings us to this, because you, you haven't always had bicycles and, and cars and trains and planes. You like to get out and hoof it, don't you? Actually, when I, tra I, I, I do walk for the exercise, but when I travel, I find walking's a good way to get to know uh, a new community. One of the first things I do when I go to a new town is I'll ask at the local history museum or at the Chamber of Commerce for walking tours. And that's sort of my orientation strategy. And that works in places as large as Buffalo, and it works in places as small as Keysville. It's a good way to find out I'm always interested in, in why a, a village or a city is where it is. Why, was it, why did somebody, when there was uh, no settlement, decide to stop there? What were the natural resources? What was the natural transportation pattern? I learned a concept from a professor at Plattsburgh State, John Moravik, of trying, oh, to, oh, trying yes. to study what he calls the sequential occupancy of an area. 
and what was on the spot 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, you find that every community has a few favorite sons or famous people. You take a walking tour and you find out that the next house on the, on, on the uh, itinerary is a house that a secretary of state lived in or somebody who invented actually in Canandaigua, New York, and I talk about this in the book, all of a sudden I find I'm in front of the house where the gentleman lived who came up with the science necessary to put sound onto film so that we could have the movie new newsreels. And he was a co-founder of the company that I can barely remember called Fox Movie Tone that uh, uh, distributed, I remember very well. distributed uh, yes. newsreels to, to sure. uh, movie houses, but that's where the technology started. His lab was uh, a small brick structure back behind his house. and. They, the town has actually restored that a little bit to give you a sense of what it was like to make those discoveries. And then every town's got a few characters in it, too, and uh, some of that comes through when you do a walking tour. Not to mention the, archi uh, the uh, architecture varies from city to city. If you're in western New York, you may find yourself walking through a town which has unique cobblestone architecture. Yeah. Another town you're going to find is near a uh, sandstone quarry, and you're going to see these wonderful Romanesque sandstone buildings. One of the walks in the book is in Granville. Granville is located amidst slate quarries, and I did a walking tour of uh, slate roofs with, of almost every imaginable design. With, Aren't they great? Well, number one, uh, I knew there was red slate and gray slate. I didn't know how many other colors there were in between. <laughs> uh, I, I've learned to uh, get a sense of what kind of slate is best for which kinds of uses. You find slate, you, slate sidewalks. The cemetery in Granville has slate gravestones. Uh, again, you, you, depending on where you are, you always find there's a unique, uniqueness to it. And it's kind of nice to see that Granville actually has their slate bu business thriving a little bit again today. No kidding. It, it has started to grow. Now, oh, I don't know great. what's happened. The last few months have been so difficult for almost every area around the country. I don't know how the slate industry is doing right now, but it's nice to know that that historic enterprise is, is still thriving and creating quite a few jobs in that area. Isn't that great? And the people who have slate roofs like to keep the slate roofs. But now there's a new product called Faux Slate, which they use down at the uh, Trinity Episcopal Church to cover the church and all the other buildings. It looks so real driving by, you'd never know. Well, I guess it's, it'll last as long as slate. I'm kind of <laughs> sorry you told me. I didn't know there was something uh, called faux slate. <laughs> I think that's what they called it. At least that's what I called it. We did take a tour there, what, a couple of years ago, maybe? About four or five, yeah. <clears throat> four or five years ago after they did it. And it looks great from a distance. And I know how expensive it is to replace parts or all of slate roofs or to put a new one on a home today. And you better be able to write the checks because it's not it's not cheap. No, but it does last for, uh, I'm, oh, yeah. I, I assume that if you put up a slate roof, you're going to get a century's worth of use out of it. Now where, you know, let's go back in time to your childhood. Did your parents take walks with you? How did you develop this great passion? I, they certainly took walks with us and, and we took walks in the woods. They were not avid hikers or anything. Um, Everywhere I wanted to go, if I visited a city, I would be walking back then. I think I developed it partly um, when I was in college. I didn't have a car, so that was a good stimulus to do a lot of walking. I found myself having to take buses and trains if I was going to go to other cities. I'd find myself do a lot, doing a lot of walking, and inevitably, you'd pass by something, some impressive building, and say, what is it? And if you really wanted to know, you'd have to go ask somebody. Well, so you're, curi some you're curious by nature. I think you were born curious. I'm curious. I think that, I think all of us are born curious. I just kind of got to the point where I was expecting to find an answer for everything. And uh, I, 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 would find, I would find excellent sources, most of whom would lead me to then walk on to other things that I should see if I'm interested in that first spot that I found. And... Again, I, I use it as a, uh, a way to get exercise. I use it as a way to get to know a new area. Um, nothing beats a walk in the woods. There's no I, uh, I If I had a choice to, of any way to spend a summer afternoon, it's going to be with an Adirondack hike. But if somebody doesn't want to climb a mountain, 
There's still plenty of walks you can take that are relatively level that, that can be more easily done. If you don't happen to have the opportunity to be in the mountains, uh, there's no shortage of other opportunities, whether you're in the North Country or elsewhere around the state. It turns out New York has this incredible canal system oh, that boy. was developed in mostly in the early 1800s. So much a great and, part of our history. Huh? And uh, canal towpaths make wonderful biking and oh, walking my, trails. My, my. And it's nice <laughs> that now communities are starting to restore some of these trails and take advantage of them instead of seeing them as just a remnant of a, of a, of a past era. It's hard to convince people to have a sense of history when they're living it. <laughs> yeah, well, you're probably right. <laughs> One of my good friends, Cheese Rock, in the town of Schuyler Falls, came into my house the other day with a, I call them treasures, a little care package. Uh -huh. And he opened it up. <clears throat> and it was his sister's memorabilia from the Kennedy years. Kennedy's life and death. All the books, the Life magazine, the Press Republican the day he was assassinated. On and on and on. As a young, you know, you can't, you couldn't avoid that time. If you were more than two years old, everybody knows what they were doing when that happened, as we mm -hmm. do with all the other major events in our lifetime. But for me, as a young radio announcer, having to read that to all the people in this area on the local radio station, impact on my life was heavy. So I opened that up, and you know, my wife looks as that is another stack of stuff. Well, you'll and be... I'm sure you have lots of <laughs> stacks of stuff, just like I do around my house. But opening those pages just brought it back to me. Yeah, you'll be happy to know that I have my own trove of Kennedy memorabilia. Do with you all really? The, with all well, the compare headlines notes and sometime. all the books. I'll bring it over. And, oh, wouldn't that be fun? And your wife can judge whether my stack's <laughs> more interesting than the one you've got now. You know what she'll <laughs> tell you? Richard will give you anything you want. Just don't leave that stuff here. <laughs> Anyway, um, walking tours are great. I mean, I love to fly. If I want to get somewhere in a hurry, I love to fly. But then I love to walk around when I get there. People say, have you been to Chicago? Yeah, many times. What, what did you find you like the most about it? I don't know. Uh, then I found a men's room in the airport, and I found my next flight out of there, and that's the extent of it. So stop. Kay and I love to go in cemeteries. Do you do that? Oh, certainly. It's... I got told early when I was doing my column, uh, I got a call from a friend, and he said, if you really want to do an interesting column and you want to learn the history of an area, go to Newfane, Vermont, and study the cemetery. And so I took him up on it, and we went over to Newfane, Vermont, and it was fascinating. We studied 280 years of history in the cemetery. We, we learned about the various American wars. We learned about some of the epidemics. We actually learned how the town had to be moved at one point. And the cemetery, of course, is, had to be left behind. So the cemetery is the, about the only original part of town that's there. You forget that in those days, people moved houses around. It's hard to believe in this day and age. There are, uh, there are some fascinating cemeteries in New York State, of course. Actually, if I was going to give you one cemetery that I would recommend taking a walk in, it would be the Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester which was built oh, during the Victorian era when they I've were... been there, but many, many, 50 years ago. It's a fascinating cemetery. It's, it, the terrain is varied, so it can actually be a challenging hike. It's notable, of course, for the people who are buried there. Uh, the founder of, Ro of Rochester, who was a general named Rochester, Nathaniel Rochester, I believe. Susan B. Anthony is buried there. I didn't know that. Uh, Frederick Douglass is buried there. He had written his abolitionist newspaper in Rochester. But Rochester was a city of entrepreneurs, and one of the firms that was founded there was the Bausch & Lohm optical industry, and so Mr. Bausch and Mr. Lohm were buried there. But the cemetery is varied enough in terms of its terrain and its landscaping that they actually give organized tour, arbor, Arborist tours, just so you can see the various trees sure. in that cemetery. There you go. Yeah. And again, there's Victorian architecture to see. Um, I have never toured the Buffalo Cemetery, but I am told that's the same the same kind of uh, opportunity. A lot of the small. I have one cemetery in the book that I'm particularly partial to, and that's a cemetery in Auburn, New York. And that has it has a monument to some of the early native settlers of that area. It includes the graves of a Professor Dulles of the Auburn Seminary, 
uh, who had two kids who went on to become become important historically. John Foster Dulles as Secretary of State and his <laughs> brother Alan Dulles I would, I would as head of the right. CIA. William oh, wow. Seward is buried there, who was part of Lincoln's cabinet oh, and sure. who has come to a lot of people's attention these past two years oh, yes. for being in Doris Kearns Goodwin's team of rivals. My favorite spot in that cemetery, however, is uh, a series of unmarked stones that were used for people who lived in a local orphanage, and the woman who ran the orphanage had stipulated that when she died, she wanted to, instead of having a large grave elsewhere in the cemetery, she wanted to be buried amidst all the people she had helped care for all those Isn't years. And it's amazing. little stories like that that make travel oh, interesting wow. and make it worth going around the extra corner or walking the extra mile and seeing what you find. It's amazing because when I first came up here, of course, I, in the radio business, we didn't make any money at all. But raising a family made it, it, the the nature of the terrain around here in the villages and towns and the, and all the ghost towns mm -hmm. made it worthy to just take the kids, grab the metal detector, and maybe a small shovel, and take a walk in the woods and discover so many ancient family cemeteries, two right, or three, right. five or ten stones on back roads all grown over. Fortunately, some of the old cemeteries in our county are being recovered. Uh, the one around the corner from Rock Store and Schuyler Falls, uh -huh. and bless the people who work there to get that back again. So cemeteries are a part of it. No question, no question. How, yes. how did you organize, how did you decide to organize the book? That would have driven me absolutely bananas. There were a few decisions I had to make. First, I was going to do walking tours in New York. And then it finally became clear to me that nobody was going to lug around a 2,000-page book. And so I, <laughs> I, so I said, OK, let's do upstate New York. I'm always saying that nobody knows where upstate New York is. I still oh, consider New, upstate New York a sort of unappreciated gem. And so I lopped off Long Island, the five boroughs of New York, and the two uh, boroughs north, or the two counties north of New York that are really commuting areas for New York City. So I had myself down to 53 counties, okay? And in order to organize it, I sort of took a map of counties and did my own gerrymandering, and I picked four districts, and I called one Adirondack North Country, one Western, one um, Hudson Catskill, and the other was Central Leatherstocking. And you can see by the way I drew the maps in the book that I, that I did a little bit of fudging along the way. And then I just set myself a target. I was going to cover 30 walks in each of those areas. I said, I'll do 120 walks, that's it. Turns out I think there's 122 in the book. That's pretty good. So I said, okay, <clears throat> I'll just say in the introduction that don't call me and say I left something out because I assume I left something out. And I would be amazed if anyone in any county wouldn't pick up the book and say, you know, there's something in this county you should have done. Indeed, since I finished the initial draft of the book, we've probably done 15 or 20 walks that deserve to be in this book, and we'll just have to wait for an updated version. So I organized it by geography a little bit, and each chapter has two walks. My idea being, if somebody goes to do one, they may as well have something else nearby so they can extend the stay. Um, I wanted to cover a pretty broad area, so Anybody driving around the state, if they keep this in their glove compartment almost no matter where they stop, they'll be within 15 or 20 minutes of some place that they can get out and take a walk. Isn't that great? And people yeah. love that kind of book. And I looked at it as a book that I hope people would use to plan some vacations. I wanted it to be uh, full of enough information that you could be an armchair traveler and enjoy it and learn something from it. And I also like to think some people were just thrown in a car and use it serendipitously sometime if they're on My anything. favorite word. If it's a business trip or they're going to visit relatives for a holiday or an anniversary or they're on their way to Niagara Falls and they don't want to make the whole drive in one day, they can stop wherever they choose, whether they're camping or staying in a four-star hotel and maybe pick up the book and find something that's in that area that might be worth seeing. Isn't that great? So that's what you did. Uh huh. And you have enough information almost for a uh, chapter two? Uh, there's certainly, uh, I, easily, uh, have, I easily have 20 more 
walks that could have been in there. I probably have more if I really went through my notes, but I've had 15 or 20 since I finished up the initial research for this book. Um, I left things out in Clinton County. You can't put everything in. Of course. One of my favorite walks in this county is Silver Lake Mountain. And oh, I, gosh. And I had to make a choice because you can't sell a book all around the state if all the walks are in Clinton County. And so I, <laughs> so I had to stop. <laughs> so when, if, if, if this book is successful and I decide to do a second one, whether it's completely different or whether it's just a revised and expanded edition, you can look for Silver Lake Mountain to be in it. Think of, think of how many miles you've walked just to gather the material for this book. I've kind of chosen not to think about how many miles I've walked, but I will tell you, it was usually uh, anywhere from one to five miles at a time. There are no marathon walks in the book. I point out areas that you can extend your walk by 10 to 100 miles, really, but probably half the walks in the book are no more than a mile, mile and a half. And I remind people, this is a good way to, to walk a mile and a half, is to have something to see on the way. The time goes fast, um, and I want people to do it. I'm not riding, I'm, I'm not a mountaineer person myself. I like to climb mountains, but not, I'm not a technical climber. I want to write things that are going to be accessible that um, I don't have to have people get special training for. Instead, my attitude is they're going to have to find an excuse not to do some of these. Isn't that, and some of those... Some of the walks would be available for handicapped folks. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> That's a good part. Most of the village walks certainly are. Uh, many, of, I would say probably most of the walks that are along canals. And then there's other interesting places that you forget that you can do a lot of walking. Good example is I write about Bird Cliff, which is an artist colony outside of Woodstock, New York a colony that was started during the arts and crafts era when Albert Hubbard was started, starting the Roy Croft um, enterprise out in western New York. These people from England built, it was, uh, built Birdcliff as an artist retreat. It's a, it's, most of the homes are in private hands, but these are places where not only Helen Hayes spent a summer, but also Bob Dylan's band spent a summer. <laughs> uh, Chevy Chase spent a summer there working on material. Uh, there. It's an interesting heritage. You see a little bit of architecture. I have to admit, you have to do a little bit of climbing. But it's a one-mile walk. It's definitely handicapped accessible. Among the interesting walks I found in the state were some of the outdoor sculpture parks. And, Aren't they great? And the, the biggest one is Storm King, which is down not far from the New York Thruway, oh, which you I can know. actually see from the park. Oh, yes. You can walk all day. Uh, it's it's handicapped accessible, but it's accessible. It would it would fill a day for somebody who is who's walking solely for the sake of exercise as well. They provide a trolley, so you can take a break and and take the trolley. We use the trolley as sort of our introductory strategy. There, we took the ride around the park to get an idea. How of many what times have you there. done that? Yes, I've been to Storm King a couple times, and but there's others. There's one outside of Casanova. Explain uh, to people what you're talking about. Some people have no idea. These are, <coughs> depending on the park, these are, peop these are places where a fair amount of land has been preserved, usually with interesting terrain, some rolling terrain, and large-scale sculptures and medium-scale uh, scale sculptures have been commissioned specifically for the, for the landscaping of that area. When I say large, my favorite sculptor who was represented at Storm King is a gentleman named Mark De Severo. And, and please understand, I'm not an art, uh, I enjoy art, I don't know a lot, I'm not trained in art history or in art theory, but there are people you just, you can just appreciate, and for that matter, there's nothing wrong with going to a sculpture park and not liking anything. My attitude is, if you get the exercise and learn something, you got it's it. worth the day. Whereas some people work in clay, some people work in bronze, some people sculpt out of stone, Mark D. Severo's medium is the industrial two by four. And so he's using two, he's using these huge beams and some of his sculptures are equivalent to four and five stories high, yet he tries to make them such that they'll actually move in the wind. They are to convey an emotion as best as I can describe it. And they do so. Uh, it's, it's very, it, it's interesting to see them. It's interesting to see them from a distance then walk right down to them and see how far they tower over you. It's nice if you have kids along with you because 
they can kind of play on these sculptures. These aren't things. Oh, yeah. This is not like the typical museum <laughs> where you have to stay beyond, behind the rope and you better not get your hand too close to a picture or a buzzer is going to go off. These are, these are things that you can experience in a completely different way. And I'm sure there are viewers watching this program on Hometown Cable for Dr. Richard Frost who have never even heard that phrase about the sculpture parks. <clears throat> we don't have any large ones in this area. We do have a few <laughs> well, properties in Clinton County where people have chosen to, to build things out of old cars and metal sculptures. And In fairness, and they're not in the <clears throat> book, but in fairness, there is uh, there's a pretty good size outdoor sculpture park at Plattsburgh State. Oh, yes, very and, much so. Uh, and, and it's in, and I, um, well, this will be on local television. I like some of the sculptures. Some of them, let's say, well, I like less well. Calvin. <laughs> but I think that you're, that's... You're uh, so <laughs> kind. You're so kind. You know, I try to acknowledge that people use their creativity in multifarious ways. Yeah. Calvin and I have discussed some of the sculptures we've seen in museums and on the campus. And you know what? On the Today Show today, they were trying different kinds of wines, and they were some people like the wines, and some people don't. We have various tastes, and as you said, where you you know, you can say I like it or I don't like it, whether or not you know the the artist, whether or not you know his theory, or, or even understand how hard it is to work with that medium. So, you know, I've so had, be it. I've had a sculptor tell me that uh, I don't look at my as look at my mission as one to make you like something. I look at my mission as one to either challenge you or make you think. And if you think you don't like it and you can express why, then you've gotten something out of seeing what right, I did. That's what Dolly that's used the, to say with his, with his crazy paintings, you know. If, if people like it, fine. There, I was expressing myself. This is my emotion built into this thing, and so be it. And we've, I've seen, believe me, I don't misunderstand, I've seen a lot of great art at Plattsburgh State that I loved. I've seen sculptures and paintings, various kinds of artwork done by young 18 and 19 year olds that blew my socks off. And that's good. And they do, you know, they've, they've, they've had some great people teaching there and some great people working there. So, yeah, but the outdoor sculpture is special, isn't it? it, it it's really an interesting phenomenon. And um, again, you don't have to like it at all, but if you go go to Canadian cities, Montreal being obviously the, the most close by, and a percentage of the development costs of, of new buildings is designated for art. And so you walk the street in Montreal and you're going to see a lot of outdoor sculpture. I'm sorry we don't see more of it in this country. It's um, Louisville, Kentucky, which I've written about many times, has redone a lot of their downtown. It's actually a very successful urban renewal from my point of view where they've really embraced the past and, and, and made some uh, changes to make it very appealing to visitors and residents alike. And there's a fair amount of outdoor sculpture. Every now and then when I was in Louisville I'd find myself walking along and I'd get a little bit too close to a bench and I'd say excuse me only to find out the person sitting there was actually a sculpture. <laughs> you think I haven't done that? <laughs> and I've taken pictures of every one I could along the way. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, that's wonderful. And many cities have the sculptures that way. Yep. I enjoy, always enjoyed that thoroughly. Um, one foot forward is, I think, your best foot forward. Uh, How many pages? That's a good question. I'll let you... Uh, oh, I have no idea. I, I, uh, 260, something like yeah, that. Yeah, right around 260, yeah. And probably add a few more for the Roman numeral introductions and all. Yeah, 265. Okay. I, I see what you mean about having the picture in there. Same, <laughs> same one. Same picture in there. Why not? But that's my new dog on the cover, and he would want to be mentioned. Yes. On the cover, that, that's Ripken. Oh, that is that's Ripken. Ripken. That's that's my current Labrador Retriever, and uh, he actually was a very conscientious researcher on this project. Of course. And he was uh, he was careful to point out every stream you could wade in anywhere near any trail that I was taking, and I try to put that into the stories. Isn't that the greatest? <laughs> The dogs have a different sensibility than well, we do, don't they, huh? I, he, I kinda, he sort of indicated to me he's closer to the ground and gets a better feel for things <laughs> than I do. 
Uh, he has a nose for that right, stuff. Right, right. Yeah. So you started with Adirondack North Country. Right. You wouldn't dare not, would you? The first walk comes right through, <laughs> right past this building that we're in. Uh, the, my initial walk is the Battle of Plattsburgh Trail that was uh, started or developed by the Boy Scouts. And that's, that's I good. Would that's bet, the reason we're sitting here today. And I would bet that a very tiny percentage of people in the city of Plattsburgh and in Clinton County have ever walked that trail, which is a remarkable uh, historical trail. And I started, I started downtown at City Hall, where you should take a look at the historical murals. I'm sorry they're not open on the weekends, but uh, the historical murals, I, I'm big on outdoor murals and indoor murals. And I look back at the WPA projects from the 1930s as one of the great times for public art in America. But we do have a beautiful set of murals in the City Hall. And then from there, you have a chance to walk by enough sites to give a feel for where the British were, where the Americans were during the Battle of Plattsburgh. Certainly when people are walking this trail, which if you do the whole trail is an eight or nine mile trail, so there's plenty of time to stop here at the Battle of Plattsburgh Interpretive Center and, and look around and learn a little bit more. Um, you can include things like the Kent DeLord House, uh, places like Halsey's Corners. There are certainly enough historical um, uh, designated spots in this city to, to make a, a very nice walking tour. So that you start right here. You always, no matter where you are, you ought to, be, ought to be able to start right at home, I think, if you're a traveler. And so if nobody wants to do anything else in this book, they ought to at least do this one local trail that I think has been unappreciated albeit very well outlined and, and mapped by the, by the Boy Scouts here. That's wonderful. And you know, um, talk about being underappreciated, that's true of most museums in the world. Probably Even right. the major museums, and I know people who live in the shadow of some of the world's best museums who have never darkened the door. And it grieves me to talk to kids and their parents and grandparents and ask them when the last time was that they went to the Kent DeLord house and they give you that blank stare. Uh -huh. And that bothers me a lot because the history is not only outside but inside. Oh, true, of course, of course. Plus, I mean, certainly you need something to do on a day that is sleeting outside or when the rain won't stop and... Uh, now, you uh, see, I, that's what I wrote about my mother. She m so much loved nature and whatever nature could throw at you. This is many, many years ago. That when the weather was sleeting outside, that's the time she'd say, put on your coat, get your galoshes, we're going for a walk. And that's when we would do those walks as a kid. So a day like today would be gravy train. Please understand that a fair number of my columns uh, are centered around days where we drove to do something specific, the weather turned bad, I had to get a column done, so we would look <laughs> around, and we would find something else, and more often than not, we were pleasantly surprised. Serendipity, I, there's that word again. I tell people, when they say there's nothing to do, that's not a description, that's a state of mind. Oh, and I love it. So, I'm going to remember that and quote you on <laughs> okay. that. That's not, that's a state of <laughs> mind. And isn't how many times with our kids, and I've raised a big family, where the kids say, there's nothing to do. I'm bored, there's nothing to do. And I would say, get in the car, we're going to Lake Alice. Right, and, right. You know, some of, the, some of the most intriguing times of my life have been walking in the woods with Calvin and those cameras. And you know, you talk about the Flat Rock area up there. And you talk about the history with the blueberries and the huckleberries and the, and the million dollar dam. I heard about that for so long from Calvin and I said, I want to go to see the million dollar dam. And when I got there and saw this behemoth, structure in the middle of nowhere, I said, everybody in the world should at least take a look at this once, you know, and there's, and that's true of everything you write about in this book. So after, after the Adirondack region, you went to the Hudson Catskill region. No shortage of yes, things there. Yes, we'll allow you to call that northern New York. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's up, Hudson Catskill is clearly <laughs> upstate New York. <laughs> You know, uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a whole column about upstate and northern New York, and those, <laughs> the, those are very strange designations, and it, they're all in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> I have learned that, well, let's face it, if you go to anybody outside of New York State and say from, you're from New York, it doesn't matter where you live, they assume you're surrounded by skyscrapers. Oh, of course. If you go to New York City 
and you say you're from upstate New York, they think that that means somewhere between Manhattan and Peekskill. And so I've started to say what I... <laughs> That's true. So when, uh. I'm, when I'm at a distant place outside of the uh, Northeast, and somebody <laughs> says, where do you live? I say, far northern New York, just south of Montreal. And that phrase seems to get attention. <laughs> You know, I've, uh, I've done that and try to explain that we're on Lake Champlain and I correspond with lots of people via email every day, mm -hmm. who, like you do, people who enjoy your, what you do. And this lady sent me an email early this morning say, isn't it horrible that there was a plane crash near, near Buffalo and she knows that I live on Lake Champlain across from Vermont, south of Montreal. She says, and that's right near you, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yep, within a day and a half drive. <laughs> I said, you know, I might get there by 4 o'clock tomorrow morning if I start right now. But isn't that interesting? Uh, and people who don't live in New York State, when you say you're from upstate, again, you I never say upstate New York without the further defining it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Buffalo, they should be saying Western New York. Yeah, Western New York. You've done a magnificent job here, including all this information and it's in terms of the total number of walks there would be in New York State, this this just whets the appetite. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the things that's interesting in New York State right now is how much development there is in various communities for recreational trails. Um, don't you love it? The, uh, the rail trail movement, we don't see as much of it because we're not quite as crisscrossed by, by railroad tracks as many other areas in the state have been. Well, we were. <laughs> so, many, so many railroad right-of-ways have been converted to trails. So one of the ones I write about in there is one down near New Parts, which is about a 10 or 11 mile rail trail. Um, there is a lot of development in the Buffalo area and the Rochester area that way. I, com I was communicating with a friend uh, two days ago, and they have just formally signed off on the completion of a five-mile walking trail along the Shenango River oh down boy. near Norwich oh in boy. central New York. Oh boy. And as you know, they're developing, there's, uh, there's a group that's working on a Saranac River Trail in this area, which I think would just, just be wonderful. Oh boy. The, in Peru, a trail's being developed along the Little Osable River. And as far as I'm concerned, you can't have too many of these. And uh, I think it's the kind of attribute that makes a community attractive to businesses moving in, to people wanting to live there. I think our trail right, here, you know, right outside the door here, which is in the book is part of the Boy Scout Trail, the trail along the uh, lake shore along, on the former Air Force Base, is a wonderful attribute for the city. And I hope that at some point that will link up with the trail on the Saranac River. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So. And, you know, I talked an, an awful lot about the, the, the railroad tracks before, and Calvin and I have done so many shows on the railroads and what they meant to the development in this area in the past. And when the old railroad beds were around, I used to jog and walk on the railroad beds all over this region, and, and I tried to help promote them that way for future generations, and now... Most of them are gone. Once they're gone, they're gone. <laughs> and, and it's just <clears throat> too bad. Because, you know, when, they, when the railroads first move out and they pull out the tracks, wow, they're wonderful. You just walk and walk and walk forever and ever and ever. No, absolutely. absolutely. And as kids, what did we do? We walked along the tracks anyway when we were kids. I'm not sure that was a good idea. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> a very good idea, but, you know, we, we did what you'd walk along the tracks. And you know you'd have an occasional freight train come by, and we were smart enough to get out of the way. Uh huh. But rare railroad beds make wonderful tracks. No, I, obviously you know they're well drained oh, and uh, my, my, they're my. they're they're set up well, and and there are a lot of them in, in use around the state. You uh, you go into the, again the area around Buffalo, you can see them in Orange County down along the Hudson. You see old railroad right of ways that are being used. Um, and then again, the canals. You can go, you go along the Erie Canal Way from Buffalo to Troy, and well over half of that 300 plus miles is off road along towpaths, which is wonderful for walking and bicycling. Isn't it the best? Ah, the best. We do have a great state, and you, uh, your your section on the Central Leather Stocking region, which includes 
what? How would you define that region? Oh, I would define it as uh, central part of the state going down to what we call the southern tier, meaning the Binghamton area, includes the Cooperstown area, sort of, so it sort of comes up towards uh, almost to Schenectady. Uh, I think in the book, I think I actually gerrymandered it enough that it came up into Oswego County and included, and <laughs> I it, love it. And included a state not? park along you're, Lake Ontario and Oswego all County. The poetic license you need. Uh, but it include, that, that area includes, includes Syracuse and includes Rome and, and Utica and Cooperstown, of course. And those are great, wonderful, wonderful areas, which I've been through so much in the past. My dad lived in the Utica, Rome area for a long time. I love it down there. Down through Speculator, mm -hmm. oh, what beautiful places to walk in the woods. I think the important thing is, and we put a map up behind here, I think if you can throw a dart and just have it land somewhere in what I've defined as upstate New York, you'll find yourself uh, reliably close to a place where it's worth taking a long walk. You know, that's, that's a lot of good food, mm -hmm. uh -huh. a lot of good food for thought. Have you written about Letchworth in here? It, Letchworth is in there. I have a... actually. I have a full chapter on Letchworth. Oh, one of, is multiple that in the Western trails. Niagara? That's in the Western Niagara, huh? And and Letchworth again, it's a mix of forested trails and then the Gorge Trail, which takes you along the the, the, the several waterfalls of the Genesee. Spectacular. And of course, and as I told you, in every single chapter, I try to put in one other walk nearby. And my nearby walk is a little bit more climbing. It's actually the interior of Mount Morris Dam. Oh, oh, oh the best. On, on the Genesee oh, River. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I walked as much on that tour as I did on some of the hikes I did at Letchworth. But it gives you a completely different look at, uh, at the environment and, and what goes on. And if you want to forge your own trails, there are a lot of good places to walk that don't have bona fide trails where you can just use that serendipity that you talked about and just get out of the car and take off. Yeah, I guess you have to be careful that you're not trespassing. <laughs> uh, I guess you do. <laughs> but certainly, again, everybody knows how New York State has, done, has been such a pioneer in preserving land in the Adirondack and Catskill Parks, and most of that land is open for, for walking. You know, you just go to a, almost any village and start walking around and you'll find some historical markers and if you linger long enough by a historical marker somebody will pass by and and ask you what you're looking at and you'll ask them a question you'll you'll have something else pointed out to you that you have to see before you leave that happened to us in Salem New York Salem's a small town in Washington County and we found out that John J Audubon's grand grandchildren lived there and their house is, is still standing uh, there were a few other local notables. There was the remains of a mill that was important. But eventually we got told to go look at the cemetery. And it's a Revolutionary War era cemetery that has a couple of hundred Revolutionary War soldiers buried in it. And you start reading gravestones there. It's uh, not many places you can't put on a pair of good walking shoes or perhaps hiking shoes and find something to go see. You know, you and I feel the same way in this respect, that we, we stand in a place and we want to know who stood here before we were here. That's a good way to said, put it. You you look at a house and you want to know what was there, you know, who, who were the people that lived in their house? What was it like way back when? And isn't it nice to refresh some of these memories by getting people to go there and, and to talk about your feelings when you were there and to maybe instill that same passion in somebody else who might want to just take a hike. There, there's an infinite number of stories out there. Yeah. Uh, just not the, the cemeteries, but the, the beaten path and the, and the path less traveled. And, you know, it reminds me, to paraphrase that, that great old saw that says, uh, you know, you only pass this way but once. So stop and smell the roses. I always say maybe you want to pick a rose along the way, <laughs> but linger, you know? No, no question. You'd like to remember where you've been, and you need something unique to hang on to to remind you of where you've been. Um, you and I have probably both driven down the New York State Thruway many times in our lives, and we probably don't remember much about any specific trip, 
but I bet every time you've gone across New York State on Route 20 or Route 5, you've got stories that you can oh, still call up. absolutely, up. and the old Route 8 and even Route 9 north and south, because I was traversing that road north and south long before the, the Northway was ever built, uh -huh. and even before the New York State Thruway was finished. So get off the road and take a walk. I, okay, how did you get hooked up with Larry Gooley? That's what we need to know. Uh, I actually had read, I'd read some of his books that he'd written, and I was trying to decide where I was going on this book. Uh, I had contacted some publishers, and to be quite blunt, a lot of publishers take their time in getting back to you and letting you know what they want to do with the book. So I, I, I finally met Larry, and then I asked him if he'd be interested in, in doing a project together. And to his credit, first he wanted to see the manuscript before he gave me an answer, which I think is entirely appropriate. <laughs> and uh, so we ended up deciding, okay, well, this we'll, look like an honest man. Take a look here. It's uh, uh, yeah, it, you, you can be an honest person and not be a great writer. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and, and so we elected to go forward. And Larry took charge of design. Uh, is a very um, conscientious and meticulous editor. He. He did a pretty good job of keeping me to deadlines. He found that it's impossible to keep me exactly to deadlines. And, and the book came about, and we, we, went through, we went through several drafts. We did a lot of re-editing, and things took a little bit more time than we wanted, but that's always the case when you're bringing a book out. And there's the product that you see. I think it was a good collaboration. I think he would say it was a good collaboration. He and his yeah. wife were an amazing team. She, you know, we have a lot of resources, and the human resources we have in this area are sometimes unsung. And Larry and his wife are, you know, I think they're just a great team because she has a certain genius. Well, I tell you, she well. used, uh, one important bit of genius she brought to this book was the maps. Oh, yeah. Because maps are surprisingly difficult to craft. And nobody had the state broken up in exactly the units that I had out. <laughs> I think we've made so. that perfectly clear. <laughs> So it was nice to have somebody who had the, the creativity and the skill to, to bring that to pass. And she certainly had suggestions. And it worked out well. And our hope is that uh, uh, lots of people will see the book. And most importantly, I just hope lots of people use the book because I think people are going to get something out of it. And I think it's a great tool. It'll be and, a wonderful tool. And I'm hoping a lot of people who, who buy the book and read it will contact me and tell me trails that should be in next time when I do the book. Oh, yeah. You, you've only got 20 or so to start with. You're going right, right. to have to have a I'll few need another, more. I'll need another 100. <laughs> no, you always take your camera with you. Yes. You you go back, maybe not to the Kodak Brownie days, but at least to 35 millimeters. I know what film is. <laughs> lots and lots of film, and now you're into the digital age. I am into the digital age. I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get better at it. I... I've been more comfortable with my writing than I have been with my photography. I will say that one advantage of the digital age is when I'm traveling and I have my camera with me, at least when I leave, I know whether or not I have a few pictures at work. And because of the digital age, nobody knows how many I had to take before I got a good one. <laughs> well, who cares? If, you know, when you've got that, that four gigabyte memory card there. <laughs> but it does make it, and particularly when you're when, if any, if I'm climbing or I'm out in the woods, it's nice to have a simple compact camera and it's nice not to have to worry about changing film in the rain and things like that. You know, we've talked to Dennis April many times and we've talked to a lot of the great characters who write, who write and teach in this area. And, you know, I swear did I see a picture of a couple of his little cameras in the paper the other day and he, he how many times have you said, maybe you haven't, but many people say, oh, I wish I had my camera. Oh. Uh, I've learned to have it with me almost all the time when I'm away from home. What I haven't learned is it's just as important to have it with you all the time when you are at home. When the deer because, is in your front yard. Oh, you something mean? happens. You go to work, and then on the way home from work, you see something you've never seen before. And it, it would be nice to have it with me all the time. Uh, I haven't quite gotten myself to do that. I have to tell you, though, I miss film cameras. I enjoyed, I liked, I liked the, what I guess now you have to call the old-fashioned uh, single yeah, you lens, gotta call it the single, old single lens reflex cameras yeah. with film, 
and I used to still carry my film camera around and then about two years ago was the first time I had it with me and I couldn't find any place that had film for sale. That's really the limit. And now I just have just That's accepted like the fact that... It's like trying to find cassette tapes. Right. Uh, so, or even worse, eight tracks. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> now you're really going yeah. back into the dark ages. But it is, it is uh, the digital age is here. We have digital movie cameras, you know. We've, Calvin is very interested in, in old uh, Western movies and cowboy movies, old movies in general. And, you know, we, wa we watched a piece on public television the other night about the North Country and all the, the movies that were made here right. way back right. when, the early part of the 20th century. And the tragedy is most of them are gone. Right, right. I mean, by the very nature of what the film was made out of, they didn't survive. And once again, they didn't realize that they were making history, of course. Mm -hmm. So making copies was almost never an option. So here we are. Yep. So you're, that's why it's nice to have it in this book. I, yeah. Because <laughs> books, I, I, I mean, I'm sure you feel the same way I do. Books, if I, if I couldn't have books... If I couldn't walk everywhere I go, I've got almost always, I've got a book in my hand. And uh, if I didn't have that book, there would be a terrible hole in my life. There's still a, a tangible aspect of things being in print to me. I could and never have a I, digital reader. And I need, I, if, I'm, if I'm reading a newspaper, I don't want to scroll. Or I do read newspapers online. But when I'm relaxing I do in the, the evening same. I and want I'm reading my paper. a magazine or newspaper, I want it to fold, I want it to rustle. And you know uh, how many people feel that way? Very few now. <laughs> I don't know. I watched a girl. I was, I, we were in Hawaii recently and took a couple of trips. And I watched a girl walking down the road with, what do they call that thing, a Kindle? Anyway, it's a digital reader. That's know, about the yeah, size of the book. And about. you can maybe put 300 books in it at one right, time. Right. And she's going, you know pushing buttons to scroll and turn the page and I said it just ground me the wrong way and I don't mean to be demeaning but it's a personal preference for me my wife knows <laughs> that most of those stacks of stuff that we talked about before are things I printed because mm -hmm. I can't stand to read 15 pages on the screen I want it here so I can take my pencil and my marker and mark off this corner, and I want to print it out like I did with your book information this morning, rather than just read it on the screen and try to commit it from memory. So there's a lot to be said for books. Thank goodness for people like you and for me who try to write books. This is a, a very ambitious project, but one that you had endless fun gathering the information for. I, I, certainly, ha I certainly enjoyed all the researching. Uh, the, taking the it's, trips, it's doing the walks, are. that and uh, and of course the problem when you write a book is that the information gathering is the fun part, and then you find out that it's it takes a certain tenaciousness to or tenacity to get it all down on paper. I enjoy the writing part. I usually enjoy the first editing part, and then I say to myself, "This is becoming a little it." it, it after I after you edit something, <laughs> you're making me laugh. By the time I proofread something for the fourth or fifth time, I'm not sure I can see the mistakes. <laughs> you know what? We interviewed a number of authors uh -huh. uh, on Hometown Cable, and the the good authors rewrite and rewrite and edit and rewrite, and I find that totally obnoxious. I, I'm so used to writing things for the radio where you, you know, the newscast is in five minutes, you got three stories to write, you write it, you read it, you toss it. The newspaper column, you write it, that's the end of it. You know, what you see is what you get. And so it's so difficult for me when my publisher sent me a note when I got back from vacation saying, um, the editor thinks you ought to have longer paragraphs. You know, I got 32 I, ghost stories that I got to go through and turn into longer paragraphs. That's was, not easy for me. When I first got interested in writing in college, I got told, if you don't like the rewriting, don't plan to take writing too seriously. And uh, I, what you see in the newspaper when I'm in there is usually, it, it's, it's reliably the third draft. I write it, it gets edited, 
at a guest editor, but my wife, who has always been well, my chief editor. Aren't they our stalwarts? And, uh, what would we ever do then, with it? And then it goes through another editing by me. When it comes out in book form, it goes through many more, uh, yeah. uh, I forget the word, but it goes through many more versions. And, and after a while, it becomes hard. Uh, it, become, it becomes hard to proofread, again, because I, I think I could look right past the same misspelled word. Oh, I, I could all, about the, time, all the time. Five. I'm the worst speller in and the that's, world. And that's the value of, of collaborating with an editor yeah. and having that kind of uh, input. You know, I find it m even more interesting when we interview people who write children's books, picture books with two lines on a page, right, a picture, and they go through 15 rewrites. Because they want to make sure those three words are the perfect words for that picture. It's what goes on behind the scenes. But there's uh, there's <laughs> there's something about a book and the permanence uh, of it that makes you very determined that it can be the best you possible do before that yeah. you can possibly do before it comes out. Yeah. Because you feel that you hope it's going to be read and you assume that it's also going to be judged to a certain degree and you want people to think you you have the the talent and the perseverance to to get it right uh, at the same token it never comes out perfect one it's i i don't like to read my own writing out loud i don't mind talking about it i don't like to read I it out loud i always had to read my own writing out loud on the radio because yeah, while i'm while i'm reading a passage that i've written I almost always find a way I could have expressed oh, sure. it better. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I know exactly so, what you mean. And, <laughs> I, and I'm also certain that although I worked very hard to make sure there were no errors, somebody will bring some to my attention. Uh, even on this, on my Plattsburgh book, I've been fortunate, but that only two errors have been brought to my attention. Only but I'm, two? But That's I'm sure wonderful. there's some others in there, and it's it's sobering. It's... Uh, you don't want to you don't want to make mistakes for fear that others might quote you and that mistake will be perpetuated. How many authors do you read where you find where I find five mistakes in the book? Oh, far too many. Yeah. Far too many. And part and that's Not a to combination. Mention pages that aren't that aren't cut. <laughs> well, that that's true too. That's yeah. uh, But I mean, yeah, lots of uh, spelling errors, uh, gra grammatical gr egregious gra grammatical errors. Well, that's all right. Yeah, well, some of that's editing, and of course, some of it's fact checking. And, yeah. uh, and that's uh, very, very difficult. Richard Frost, we love what you do. We want to talk about how these books are available. Um, Calvin printed this out. To purchase Larry, one for. Larry Gooley did. Huh? Larry Gooley oh, did. Larry printed it out for you? I printed a couple of things online here. But. His, I love his name, and of course we've done a number of interviews every time he does something we think is noteworthy, but Bloated Toe. If that isn't right off the wall, nothing is. And I, somebody says, who publishes the book? I said, Bloated Toe Enterprises. And they never forget that, once you there's, say. There's but, something about <clears throat> having a name that sticks in your memory that helps. <laughs> uh, and the Bloated Toe and his, his reasoning behind it does too. So go online, www.bloatedtoe.com. Click the shop button to go to the North Country store. When he says blow to toe enterprises, he's not kidding. He'll sell everything. I don't know if he's got Cloverine salve, but he seems to have just about everything else on there. Last time we went to interview him, I wanted to sit in his living room, but he had books and various other things piled to the ceiling. So they're doing very well. Hit the shop button to go to the North Country store. Then enter A1A1 in the product search box. I don't know what the reason for that is. Do you? I, I can't tell you that. I do know that when you get to the website and you get to the North Country store, it's easy. It's very easy from there. To noodle around. To, to find it. But A1A1 of the product search box. And if you have any questions or any problems, you can email service at bloatedtoe.com. That's easy. Service at bloatedtoe.com. You can call in this area 518-563-9469. That's 518-563-9469. Or now that our program is on the internet and perhaps is being seen in Sumatra as we speak, you can call 
Um, and I guess I should say that it, the book is also available in, in a lot of local outlets. It is available across from us here in the uh, history shop at the Battle of Plattsburgh Association. It better be. And it's available at the Cornerstone Bookshop, Borders, uh, Peru Pharmacy, uh, Cornerstone Pharmacy, the CVPH Hospital Gift Shop, and probably about 10 other or 15 other places that I missed. Available generally for $20, I see here. Correct. Um, 30 illustrations, that includes your photographs, right? Or does it? It, it says it, 30 illustrations and four maps. The uh, four maps I can vouch for. The 30 illustrations, it, I don't know the number. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't your turn to watch, and right? Don't, don't ask me how many uh, words are in the book either. <laughs> so anyway... Um, you know, people say, well, what's the genre? Well, it's history. It's a guidebook, right? Yeah, I would call it history and travel, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and, and probably just for people who are interested in New York State heritage as well. Yeah, but I like the idea of guidebook, because that means, like Audubon's books and the other birds of you know, uh, this continent, take, you take the book for you and say, okay, where are we? Are we? We're in Rome, or we're in... In Letchworth, or we're in, you know, mm -hmm. Owl Head. I bet you don't have Owl's Head. I don't have Owl's ah. Head. Well, let me put that on my list <laughs> for the next 100. But you've done a wonderful job. I, I admire that. We haven't talked a lot about your, your chosen profession, internal medicine. But it's, that's been rewarding for you yes as well it, it's uh yeah it, it's 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 why i do it i mean it's it's something that uh has been satisfying um it's become a little bit more frustrating because the amount of paperwork has multiplied and every doctor can delineate some frustrations at the same token we're in a different world than we were even 10 years ago and almost everybody i talk to in every field can delineate some frustrations um, I guess I look at myself as fortunate. I still enjoy doing what I do. Uh, as, a, as, as an internist, I see a wide variety of problems in a wide variety of people. Uh, I like the challenges. Um, you wish you could cure everything, and one of the tough things to deal with is you can't cure everything. Um, I, would like, I, I like to think that part of what I do is motivate patients to take better care of themselves so as to better manage some chronic diseases or even better prevent some of the diseases from starting in the first place. Uh, that's why I tell them all to walk a half an hour a day. That's good for many organ systems in the body, not to mention it's a great stress reduction mechanism. Um, but you that does... Yeah, you I, love it and you'll yeah. do it for a while. Yep. I, I, I have no plans to stop doing it, but uh, um, it's a matter of if the 24-hour day were a little bit longer, it would be easier for me to do everything I want to do. How long have you had your beard? The beard was a suggestion uh, by my wife, from my wife, on the day after we got married. Come on! It, literally. Which makes me think, it makes you wonder what she was thinking before we got married. <laughs> oh, she wants uh, me to hide my face. But, uh, uh, and that's when I started, and I've had it ever since. Isn't that wonderful? And, uh, there ever was a trademark. I and I I save five to ten minutes every morning, every day of my life. It's wonderful. <laughs> and if I could grow as handsome a beard, I'd have <laughs> one as well. Well, thank you. It's one foot forward, walks in upstate New York, Richard B. Frost. You are the best. Well, enjoy talking to you, Gordy. It Thanks pleases very me much. to meet different people in, in my travels and my walks. And you're one of the neatest people I've ever met. Best to you. Okay, well, thank And your book in the future, and Bloated Toe Enterprises. Listen, folks, uh, this is what it's all about. If you have a topic or somebody you think would be an interesting character to interview on our program, let us know when and where, and we'll make every effort to do that. In the meantime, if you'd like to make a $10,000 contribution to Hometown Cable, <laughs> get out your checkbook and write it for $5 or 1500 or whatever you want to do and help to keep this program going. Calvin and I believe in what we do because we believe in the North Country. And who knows where we're going to be next time.
for our little corner